Welcome to Truth Jihad Radio, the radio show that wages the all-out struggle for truth by uncovering all sorts of interesting facts and perspectives that are normally banned, covered up, obscured, or spun, or otherwise messed with in the corporate-controlled mainstream. Today we're going to the rather complex subject of international economics, but by way of an analysis of empire. John Perkins in Confessions of an Economic Hitman showed us the debt dimension of empire. The first empire ever is our empire, the empire that runs on debt more than anything else. And if you want to learn how that works, the place to go is Super Imperialism by Michael Hudson. It's been recently reissued with a new concluding chapter, and it pretty much breaks it down. Uh, a fantastic book, and kind of disturbing, too. It makes you realize how shaky the foundations of our whole world right now are. So let's talk about it. Hey, welcome, Michael Hudson. How are you? Well, I'm pretty good, and it's good to be here. Okay, yeah, good to finally have you. I've been reading your stuff for years and years, and I, uh, I just read Super Imperialism, actually, for the first time, I hate to admit. And that's quite a masterpiece. Uh, I mean, I would think uh, if you were teaching a university course on these matters, you would have to assign it. But I'm not sure that it's mainstream acceptable enough to get that assignment. How, what's been the, the response to this The problem is not acceptability. Uh, uh, the problem is getting it into the curriculum. I, uh, I was a professor of economics uh, since uh, the 1960s. And there's no way to fit either international finance or even money and credit uh, into the curriculum uh, or the balance of payments. Uh, I don't think the balance of payments, which is uh, uh, what the key to uh, the, the world's debt problem today is, uh, is, is taught anywhere. I was told that in 1969 and 70, uh, my course was the only course in uh, balance of payments accounting in the United States. And uh, most uh, economists actually look at economies as if they're done on barter, uh, and money doesn't really appear because uh, uh, economists say, well, we owe the debt to ourselves, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, but the we who owe the debt are the 99%, and the ourselves are the 1% that things uh, the people are owed uh, to in America. And internationally, right now you're seeing crises erupt throughout uh, the world. Uh, Argentina uh, again, is about to default or repudiate uh, the debt that it owes to the uh, International Monetary Fund uh, that essentially uh, serves as an arm of American foreign policy. And that's what I discuss in Super Imperialism, how the uh, International Monetary Fund lends money uh, to uh, support governments who are friendly to the United States. And when uh, the U.S. policy neoliberalism usually, gets these economies in trouble, uh, the IMF will uh, uh, lend money to a country like Argentina uh, to support flight capital. It will enable all of the U.S. corporations uh, in Argentina uh, and the rich families to move their, their domestic money and pesos or escudos or whatever they're dealing with uh, out of the country into dollars. Uh, and then the IMF lets... Uh, the, the currency collapse, and in fact, it insists that the currency collapses because it says, when uh, if you can't pay your debt, the way to repay it is to uh, impose austerity and lower your wages, uh, and uh, stop investing in uh, public uh, uh, infrastructure, uh, stop government spending, and so the result of this policy of the IMF and uh, with the World Bank uh, right behind it uh, is to uh, make countries less and less able to pay their debts, and so they fall deeper and deeper into debt and more and more dependent on uh, U.S. Uh, official credit, IMF credit, and uh, essentially uh, debt is uh, used internationally to impoverish other countries, uh, just as it's now impoverishing the U.S. economy. And this all raises the question of why you were the only one teaching this in the universities, given its central importance for uh, history, uh, geopolitics, the way things really work in the world. And that's where I wonder whether there must not be some kind of 
uh, political uh, resistance in the form of a kind of a propagandistic way of pushing uh, particular uh, views of politics and economics coming down from the top. Like when I read John Perkins' book years and years ago, I had no idea that that was actually how it worked. It seems like somebody must not want us to know that this is how it works. Uh, not really. Uh, certainly the government wants to know how it worked. Uh, the reason that I taught balance of payments was uh, I'd been working for many years uh, for Chase Manhattan as their balance of payments analyst, and uh, then for Arthur Anderson, uh, the accounting firm that was later closed down for fraud, uh, for, uh, as its balance of payments analyst. And uh, the, uh, the topic just wasn't taught in economics. There's, uh, economic uh, theory in in the universities pretty much ignores money and credit. That's what uh, Steve Kane and I, uh, myself and the MMT people uh, at the uh, University of Missouri at Kansas City, and who have now all been dispersed, uh, Stephanie Kelton, Randy Ray, uh, we're all trying to uh, say, wait a minute, see, uh, you're looking at the economy as if it's purely technological, purely uh, physical, but uh, and you look at technology and GDP growth, but actually what grows most rapidly is debt. Uh, and the debt is uh, what is slowing the economy down and preventing the economy from growing. Uh, there's an attempt not to look at any any kind of either uh, money uh, and credit uh, created by banks or what they're creating it for, uh, which is essentially for real estate, uh, for economic rent. And you could, uh, way back in the 1890s, uh, you had economics uh, stopped. Uh, there was an anti-classical reaction uh, against Adam Smith, John Stuart Mill, Marx, Henry George, all the people who were talking about economic rent. Uh, uh, this was uh, Most of the uh, fortunes in America were all made by economic rent. So uh, they, uh, the wealthy uh, fortune gatherers and rent extractors uh, promoted a, a kind of barter theory of the economy. But in terms of what the government wanted, I, uh, when my super imperialism came out, uh, I had thought that uh, probably a lot of left-wingers uh, would buy the book, and indeed it was quickly translated into Spanish and Russian and other countries. But uh, immediately, uh, Herman Kahn at the Hudson Institute, a national security institute, hired me and said, uh, the, uh, the Defense Department wanted to uh, give a $85,000 grant for me to come uh, to Washington. So and they can so understand how they're ruling the world. <laughs> yes. They didn't re- realize that the uh, going off gold for the United States uh, left other countries with uh, uh, central banks with nothing to keep their foreign exchange reserves in uh, except uh, U.S. dollars, which meant loan U.S. Treasury bonds, loans to the U.S. Treasury, uh, essentially. And so I uh, actually, they looked at my super imperialism as a how-to-do-it book. Uh, <laughs> and for the next four years, I went, was going back and forth to the White House and other government agencies uh, sort of explaining this. And there was no attempt at all to uh, uh to uh, uh, prevent this from being discussed. In fact, uh, I worked for a lot of brokerage houses who wanted me to explain to them what the foreign exchange effects of uh, uh, American dollarization and the Treasury Bill standard were and America's free lunch. And uh, uh, Herman Kahn and uh, uh, others said, well, look, this is great. Uh, uh, American imperialism is giving us a free lunch, and uh, we're able to uh, f- uh, get foreign countries not only to finance our debt, but our balance of payments deficit, which was mainly military. So, in effect, it's foreign central banks that paid the foreign exchange costs of America's military expansion, all th- through the uh, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and uh, uh, throughout the 1960s and 70s. Uh, into the 80s all over the world. Uh, and th- again, there's, there's no, uh, economics as a discipline doesn't deal, uh, with politics. And, uh, political theory doesn't deal with economics. Uh, and so, uh, there really was nowhere for me to fit, uh, this into the curriculum at all, but, uh, uh, the book's been translated into many foreign languages. Uh, there have been at least two editions, uh, in Chinese, uh, where it sold more copies than, uh, anywhere else. And the logic, <laughs> so, 
I, I can see why China would be yeah. interested in this. <laughs> yes, uh, because if you understand how America gets a free lunch through the dollar standard, if you understand how uh, the IMF and the World Bank are impoverishing countries, uh, then uh, you realize why other countries are trying to de-dollarize, getting rid of the dollar, and uh, why this is causing uh, just desperation in the United States, which uh, cannot uh, now has to pay to finance its own uh, military expenses throughout the world with its own dollars. And that's causing uh, the dollar to go down. It's causing inflation here. It's causing other countries to break away from the U.S. orbit uh, and uh, leave the United States uh, actually isolated. So uh, the United States, uh, when it went off gold in 1971, uh, created a system that uh, gave it an enormous amount of free lunch and foreign money for 50 years, but now that's ending. It's it's uh, it's it w- became so predatory and so abusive and so destructive of the third world, destructive of other economies through the uh, the bad economics of the IMF, the uh, bad economics of the World Bank, and uh, essentially the destructive economics of neoliberalism from uh, Reagan and Bill Clinton, uh, Margaret Thatcher in England, and. Uh, social democratic parties in Europe, that uh, other countries are now uh, uh, changing. And the whole world is splitting up and fracturing uh, geographically, largely as a result of uh, financial factors, monetary factors, and uh, uh, balance of payments issues. And uh, uh, all of a sudden, uh, the, the, the whole emptiness of the way in which economics is taught uh, in the United States is... Uh, uh, is changing. Well, that's, I guess that's a good sign. But uh, uh, the good fortune for your book may not necessarily be good fortune, certainly not for the U.S. empire or maybe not even for the world. Uh, so the question that arises uh, after reading your book, the first question is if at this point China and this new bloc, sort of Russia and China, and of course Iran is on their side, and various other countries are interested, if, if this new bloc is going to try to break out of the uh, dollar scam that you describe in the book. Question, the biggest question is why hasn't anything like this happened before? Because as you described before World War II, it was just kind of taken for granted that the, uh, the a country that runs a, a huge deficit, gets into debt, ends up at the mercy of its creditors. And somehow the U.S. has flipped that around, especially after Nixon uh, went off the gold standard, and the, rather than the, the world responding the way that all countries did prior to World War II um, by pursuing their own national interests, it uh, seems like most of the world has spent many decades accepting a grossly unfair system in an unprecedented way. So why is, has the reaction been so, um, <laughs> so bizarre uh, after World War II when before that it, it would have been unthinkable? Well, all along, other countries realized that the system was unfair. General de Gaulle explained how it was unfair uh, already in the 60s. Uh, The problem is there wasn't, uh, in order to have an alternative, there had to be a critical mass. Uh, And that meant a critical economic mass. Uh, The United States uh, had one way of convincing other countries to go along, saying, "We'll, we'll wreck your economy if you don't uh, follow our rules and we'll wreck your economy by doing what uh, they're trying to do to Russia and uh, China and other countries today by imposing economic sanctions. Uh, and by sanctions, they meant we won't, uh, you need our exports and you need our market. Uh, where are you going to sell your goods except to uh, wealthy Americans? Uh, where are you going to get your food except from American farms? Uh, other countries weren't able to feed themselves uh, and uh, they weren't able to find, uh, find really a, a market because all of the markets were plugged in uh, to U.S. consumers and U.S. consumption and U.S. Uh, foreign investment. And uh, other countries just didn't have really uh, – they weren't willing to make – uh, the step towards uh, public uh, infrastructure investment themselves. There was somehow uh, an idea that if you privatize uh, infrastructure, uh, it'll become cheaper 
And of course, that's not the case. It, it's loaded down with debt and becomes a monopoly and becomes more expensive. Well, it took uh, 50 years for other countries to develop to the point where uh, a few, two years ago, when the United States uh, imposed agricultural sanctions on Russia, uh, uh, Russia said, OK, we'll grow our own uh, cheese. Uh, we'll make our own uh, grain. And now, uh, two years later, Russia is the largest uh, agricultural exporter in the world. Well, that wasn't the case during the Cold War years uh, as a result of uh, the awful uh, collective farm uh, uh, system that was over there. Same thing with China. Uh, 30 years ago, uh, China had not uh, developed uh, an ability to uh, produce high technology goods, cars, aircraft, electricity. Uh, it took a long time for other countries to develop. And fortunately, uh, you, you had uh, Bill Clinton and uh, uh, George Bush and uh, Obama uh, essentially uh, promote uh, the uh, offshoring of American industry. Uh, Amer they uh, promoted American companies to say, why do you hire American uh, high, high wage labor when you can hire foreign labor? And the foreign countries have all uh, had their uh, currencies decline, largely because they, whenever a country has to pay debt, uh, it throws its currency onto the foreign exchange market. The currency goes down. And what's really devalued when a country uh, lowers as its exchange rate is the price of labor. So all of a sudden, the result of this uh, dollar standard and uh, IMF pro-creditor policy was to make labor outside the United States uh, much less ex expensive than uh, labor in the United States. So uh, con uh, American industry began to move uh, to Asia, uh, not only China, but to other countries uh, in Asia. Uh, European industry did the same. And all of a sudden, uh, 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 China had said, well, you know, we're quite happy to have you come in and build factories here and use our w uh, low wage labor, but you have to show us how to build the factory. You have to be a, uh, you know, share your technology with us. And so the American companies were glad to share their technology since the 19. 90s, and since it joined the World Trade Organization uh, and, uh, j just around uh, the uh, 2000, and uh, n now uh, other countries say, "Okay, thank you for the technology. Uh, we really don't need you anymore. We've uh, uh, we've got rich uh, ex uh, enough exporting to your market. We've got we can rely on each other for our own market. We can create our own." Uh, currency. Uh, we don't need dollars. We have our own printing presses. <laughs> uh, in our countries, we spend uh, our own currencies, say uh, yen or, or uh, whatever. And so uh, it, you, you could just see how all of this is unfolded. And basically, that's what uh, my book, Super Imperialism, is about, how this, how this process unfolded and left America all of a sudden without industry uh, and itself as a debtor country. And what were they thinking when uh, Clinton and uh, subsequent presidents and, and other the people behind them decided to go ahead and basically export uh, U.S. productive capacity, move the factories abroad? Uh, did they really believe that that was sustainable? Or uh, there's a conspiracy theory out there that there are these evil globalists who are out to destroy the United States. Many Trump supporters believe in that. Of course, the Trump supporters also believe that the system you describe is actually uh, working against the United States, that the U.S. has been totally generous and throwing away all its money on these ungrateful other countries and so on and so forth. Um, so, but, but getting back to that issue of, of the exporting U.S. productive capacity, why did they do that? Well, uh, you asked whether, uh, didn't they see where it was leading? That's the wrong question to ask. They didn't care. The, frame, the time frame of uh, corporate investors is uh, usually three months, uh, but especially one year. All they care about is the next year. That's what their salary is based on. Uh, they knew exactly where it was leading. They didn't care because they said, we'll be retired by then. We want to make as much money as we can, as quickly as we can. Uh, our salaries as CEOs is based on how high we can push the stock price. Let's push the pr uh, stock price high we'll get our bonuses we'll get our high salaries and uh, it uh, you know even if it collapses later 
by that time, we'll be retired as multimillionaires. Uh, and they didn't care. And there was also something else. They did. Uh, they they wanted to hurt labor. The Democratic Party has always uh, looked at labor as uh, what Hillary Clinton said: white labor is deplorable. Uh, <laughs> the employers don't like labor. There's a class war, and Clinton, uh, like Tony Blair in England, essentially uh, 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 revived the class war against labor. Uh, he threw all of his weight behind uh, corporate industry and the Democratic Party. Uh, ever since uh, Clinton and uh, uh, Obama uh, has, has threw its weight behind, uh, uh, essentially, uh, it became the party of Wall Street and uh, large corporate America and uh, uh, the oil industry and and uh, uh, foreign investors. And uh, their uh, business plan is to make money as quick as they can, uh, take their money and run. Uh, and uh, so it was perfectly logical to them. Uh, of course they knew what was happening. Uh, but to them, the fact that they were getting rich and labor was getting further and further in debt was actually a bonus because uh, – they're really very nasty people. Their ideology is nasty. They want to get rich by uh, uh, making other people poorer. That's their strategy. Uh, the whole business plan of uh, the United States economy for the last 20 years is for uh, the wealthy 1% to get the 99% in debt, uh, and for America, uh, investors and banks to get third world countries in debt and then say you have to lower your uh, uh, wage rates, you have to uh, stop unionization, you have to uh, essentially uh, uh, provide uh, uh, low-priced labor. Uh, and at a certain point, uh, this, uh, uh, th this is what – it was the United States actions itself uh, by uh, the uh, uh, Clinton and uh, all the subsequent uh, presidents, uh, especially Obama, uh, that uh, essentially forced other countries to uh, uh, to go it alone, which is the one thing that uh, was the opposite of uh, creating uh, an empire. You can't have a unipolar, single global economy if you force other countries to uh, to uh, remain in your uh, empire only by impoverishing their own labor force. At some point, they're going to push back and they're going to say, we don't want to be uh, impoverished. And uh, that's exactly what's happening uh, m week after week and month after month in today's news. And in today's news, we see uh, claims that this new Democratic administration wanted to change things and push these big infrastructure projects and uh, engage in a certain amount of Bernie Sanders-style redistribution and so on, you know, claims that the Democrats were sort of revitalizing the uh, American left, such as it is. You write in, in a new article about the demise of the Democrats that today's U.S. political duopoly uh, it features the Democrats uh, there's, as a, having the key role of protecting the Republicans from attacks from the left, and that's basically all they do. So I imagine you weren't particularly surprised when these ambitious Bernie Sanders-style proposals uh, have pretty much all fallen by the wayside. Uh, there was never a chance of them taking place because the philosophy of the uh, Democratic National Committee that really runs the party is, well, if we have, pro if we do have infrastructure, it has to be, uh, as a giveaway to, uh, monopolies that are going to get rich off the government grants to them. There, there are two kinds of infrastructure spending. Uh, the United States in the 19th century, late 19th century developed the whole philosophy of infrastructure spending. And uh, uh, Simon Patton, who was the first uh, economics professor in the United States at a business school, business school professor at uh, Wharton School, said uh, uh, infrastructure is a fourth factor of production alongside labor, land, and capital. Uh, but uh, the purpose of infrastructure isn't to make a profit. It's for the government to invest and provide low-cost essential needs, education, transportation, communication, and uh, to, to provide low-cost infrastructure so that uh, the uh, uh, American industrialists can employ labor that doesn't have to pay a high cost for education, doesn't have to pay a high cost for health care, doesn't have to pay a high cost for uh, communications or cable TV uh, or telephones or anything else. Well, uh, all this changed uh, 
after the 1980s uh, with uh, mar- uh, essentially neoliberalism of Margaret Thatcher and uh, uh, Reagan and uh, Bill Clinton. They said, we want uh, to privatize infrastructure. Instead of having the government provide low-cost infrastructure, uh, we're given a, uh, our political campaigns are paid for by the big monopolies, and we're going to give uh, 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 Comcast and uh, uh, the, the Spectrum uh, the, uh, the right to charge, uh, you know, huge uh, economic rents from uh, cable TV. We're going to we're going to have uh, we're going to turn our public roads that are free into toll roads, like the Indiana toll road. Uh, uh, we're going to turn uh, the streets into and parking meters. We're going to privatize them, uh, uh, as uh, Chicago did uh, by privatizing. Its meters. We're going to make America the highest priced economy in the world, and all this high priced economy is going to go to uh, to mono- infrastructure monopolies. And so, uh, the uh, the original plan, uh, the rate, uh, the uh, Biden plan, uh, essentially the Democratic Party's plan, is to give its campaign comp- contributors monopoly rights to infrastructure. The Americans, well, it'll be like uh, pharmaceuticals where the American government will pay the cost of developing a pharmaceutical, and then it'll give it to uh, a drug company, uh, whoever is its biggest campaign contributor, for $1, and let the drug company make half a, half a trillion dollars. Well, that's pretty much what they've uh, done with the COVID vaccines. Yes, that's exactly right. That's right. Uh, the government... Uh, Paid for developing the vaccine, gave a monopoly to its campaign contributors, and uh, uh, now said, uh, you know, you can make all you want here, and this is wonderful. If you have it, now we can make the third world countries pay so much money for the vaccine that their currencies will go down, and we can uh, employ their labor even more cheaply and get their raw materials even more cheaply. So uh, that's part of the system. It's the, the infrastructure, as the Democratic Party sees it, is a, is a travesty of what American infrastructure was uh, a century ago. Uh, that, and they don't, uh, they don't realize that it's the way in which infrastructure is financed and what it's priced for that uh, is the key. Uh, of course, Bernie Sanders said, look, uh, American companies won't have to pay their uh, employees so much money if uh, uh, if you uh, the government pays for all of their medical costs. Right now, 18 percent of America's GDP goes uh, for health insurance and health care. Uh, that's higher than any other country, and the health care is much worse because it's all done for profit uh, and uh, done uh, as cheaply as possible, and uh, it's been financialized. So the angry reaction to this that we would expect uh, has to some extent developed as the, abroad as this new block with Russia and China kind of at the heart of it uh, are pushing to de-dollarize, which could take down the empire by preventing the U.S. from running these massive deficits to support its military occupation of so much of the globe. Uh, but here in the United States, the angry reaction to it has come through the Republicans and uh, the Trump movement. And those people, of course, are even less interested in uh, keeping public infrastructure cheap and pushing through Bernie Sanders-style proposals. They're even more interested in uh, giving their contributors monopoly rents uh, to make fabulous fortunes by uh, ripping people off. So where will the well-informed, angry reaction to this come in the U.S. political system? Do we need a third party, or could the Trump movement morph into a more enlightened, angry populist movement? I don't see either. I, you, you've stated the problem very clearly. Uh, what you just said is exactly what's occurring. Uh, it's a- almost impossible to start a third party in the United States. Uh, Bernie Sanders looked into that years ago, and uh, the way that the state laws are written uh, in, uh, uh, really blocks any third party from getting onto the ballot. Uh, the Democrats and Republicans have uh, such uh, uh, small print in the laws that it essentially blocks. Uh, anyone from doing anything so that when you have someone like Bernie uh, coming in as an independent uh, he has to caucus with either the Republicans or the Democrats uh, I certainly don't see uh, the Trump uh, the Republicans being any better because they're just like the Democrats it's, think of them as the same party there's really no difference but they have different constituencies uh, and uh, the, uh, it, uh, 
they uh, both are financed by the same campaign contributors, by Wall Street, uh, the large corporations, uh, oil and gas, uh, the pharmaceuticals uh, industry, and it really doesn't matter. For instance, if you look at the last month's elections in, uh, for the mayor of, uh, in, of, uh, uh, in, in New York State, Buffalo, uh, you had uh, the Democratic Party being a left winger, and so the Democratic National Committee and the Democratic uh, Party, National Party backed the Republican, saying, you know, we'll back the Republicans against uh, uh, Bernie or any follower of uh, any uh, any progressive uh, person. So you have the duopoly uh, firmly in control, very much like the Roman Senate was uh, in control at the end of the Republic and was able to block any kind of uh, progressive uh, movement. And you have the the big media, uh, the New York Times, uh, the Wall Street, uh, uh, New York Times, the Washington Post, and uh, uh, the major uh, TV networks, just not talking about the kind of things that we've been talking about for the last half hour. Certainly not. (laughs) Well, the progressive movement, used to be something quite different from what it is now. In the late 19th century and the early 20th century, it was much more interested in these kinds of issues that you raise. And today, it seems like the so-called progressives are mostly interested in gender pronouns and uh, racial hysteria. And do you think that could be a deliberate strategy by uh, people with a lot of money who have the money to hire Edward Bernays-style PR experts uh, in order to hoodwink the average people and get them, you know, paying attention to the wrong things? I think that's exactly what's happened. Uh, you, uh, the question is, if you, you were to have a third party or a progressive movement, what are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about uh, economics, uh, about wages, about economic issues, about debt, uh, uh, and how do you how do you prevent uh, any movement from coming and talking about economics? Well, uh, the Democrats on, uh, from uh, already in the 1960s, but especially from the 1990s on, said, "Okay, let's uh, divide uh, the electorate into hyphenated Americans." Uh, so, the, uh, in the 1960s, you had Italian Americans, Greek Americans, uh, uh, Irish Americans. Well, uh, now, as you just say, it's divided by gender, by ethnicity, by race, and uh, what all these uh, people have in these different hyphenated uh, groups uh, have identity groups have in common is they're all wage earners. But the one thing you don't talk about is wage earners. If you can get people to think themselves of themselves uh, in terms of uh, uh, ethnic or racial or gender uh, uh, groups, then they won't think of themselves as having the common denominator of being wage earners, debtors, and taxpayers and consumers. And if, if they think of themselves as uh, consumers and debtors, and uh, then they're going to want uh, debt relief. They're going to want uh, an end of monopoly pricing for consumers. Uh, they're they're going to want uh, progressive taxation and shift the tax on to the uh, billionaires, not onto themselves. Uh, and uh, that uh, both uh, the Democrats and Republicans want to make sure that that's uh, not happened. So uh, the Republicans have become the party of uh, 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 essentially uh, white working class labor, which the Democrats say, well, they're deplorables. We'll take all the rest and we'll play them off against each other. Well, that's uh, that's uh, I don't know how long that can last before people wake up and say, wait a minute, we all have a common problem. And the common problem, you know, as I just said, we have debt problems. We're all in debt. We're struggling to make a living. Our wages aren't going up while profits are going way up. Uh, we're having to pay more and more to the monopolists, and uh, uh, we're we're afraid to uh, quit our jobs and complain about working conditions because then we'd lose our health care, and uh, uh, we we'd fall behind in our rents and be evicted or we'd lose our homes. Uh, this is uh, not a situation where uh, that we were promised in 1945 after World War II. And they'd all, uh, they would say there is an alternative. Well, the Democrats and Republicans have, a com- have adopted Margaret Thatcher's uh, slogan, there is no alternative, Tina. And uh, as long as people believe there is no alternative, they'll just somehow blame themselves. And they'll think, well, gee, we're a failure. Uh, uh, we, we haven't succeeded. And they don't realize that 
the the deck is stacked against them, and uh, they have to change uh, how the uh, economy works uh, systemically. And uh, now that there is an alternative in, in China and other countries, they can say, wait a minute, it doesn't have to be this way. Our wages can go up. Uh, what China does is, that makes it so unique is it hasn't left the financial uh, system and money creation in the hands of banks. The government creates the money, and the government can write down debts. So when uh, you have a very uh, you have big companies uh, going into debt uh, to essentially expand the economy, the Chinese government can just write it down. Uh, the U.S. government can't have uh, Chase Manhattan or Citibank or uh, Bank of America write down the debts because they'd uh, they'd lose all the political campaign contributions and uh, the, the 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 banks would create a crisis. So uh, essentially, what's blocking the United States uh, recovery is financialization. And as long as you have this financialization, uh, which is also occurring throughout the world and is causing a whole crisis in the third world uh, today, as long as you have financialization, you're going to have a slow crash that's getting uh, more and more austerity until uh, we end up looking like Argentina. Well, uh, financialization is a is kind of a fancy word that seems to describe the transfer of the economy from Main Street to Wall Street. And it, it occurs to me, reading your work, uh, and, and one of the great things about your work, of course, is the sweep of history where you, you can touch on these historical examples from the Roman Empire and even back to biblical times. It occurs to me, thinking about that, that the, really there's sort of two basic underlying scams at, at the heart of these processes that you describe. And those are, on the one hand, compound interest, which, of course, is mathematically unsustainable, mon- the mo- you know, money growing faster than the physical things it can represent. And then the other is uh, rent extraction, unearned rent extraction. Somebody has a piece of paper that says, I own this land or whatever. I own this money. I own this anything. And so you have to just pay me uh, for sitting here on my butt <laughs> doing nothing because I have this piece of paper I can wave in your face. And, and these two kinds of unearned uh, wealth uh, seem to be at the root of so many of these problems. And you can see why, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm Muslim and you know, we're quite fervently opposed to usury although most Muslims don't have the faintest concept of what's really going on, what's really at stake. and uh, but, but that core principle of usury being a, a horrendous uh, sin and something that just needs to be stomped out and that God and his prophet and the community of his prophet, by extension, has to be at absolute all-out war with usury, meaning all forms of lending and interest uh, for all of eternity, and that principle is, right, is, is there. So I'm wondering if uh, you think that um, enlightening people to this, uh, if, you know, just like people, when they understand a Ponzi scam, they can avoid being taken in by it. At some point, will humanity awaken and recognize that unearned rents and compound interest uh, need to be abolished? Well, this is what classical economics is all about in the 19th century. Everything from Adam Smith to David Ricardo to John Stuart Mill to Marx to Alfred Marshall to Thorstein Veblen, the whole 19th century tried to get rid of uh, land rent and economic rent by the landlord class, which John Stuart Mill said economic rent is what landlords make in their sleep. It's unearned income. We want uh, a classical uh, idea of a free market was to free markets from economic rent and from uh, monopoly rent, from land rent, and from national re- natural resource rent. And the idea was that uh, taxes – uh, should uh, essentially uh, siphon off uh, all the uh, rise in uh, l- land values and natural resource values and uh, economic rent. And uh, that was uh, the whole idea is that that's where the world was moving towards uh, uh, until World War I. Everybody expected the governments to play a, uh, a rising role, and it was in the United States and Germany where government was playing the most active role in promoting industrialization and preventing economic rent by uh, the U.S. Uh, antitrust laws uh, and other countries' uh, similar laws, that uh, these became the leading industrial nations. Well, today, uh, economic rent is uh, essentially being fo- uh, uh, opposed 
primarily uh, in China and the socialist countries, and now it's called socialism. But it used to be called a free market to Adam Smith, and so uh, this is one reason why in the last uh, 30 years uh, they don't teach a history of economic thought in the economic curriculum anymore. They've replaced it with, a, uh, with mathematics, and so people are not even aware that the whole idea of a free market is turned away from uh, a, a, a market that's free from uh, rent extractors, free from uh, banking and uh, private banking and credit uh, towards a market free for uh, rentiers, free for uh, landlords to get as much as they can and not pay taxes on it, free for the banks to make financial interest and uh, uh, not have to pay uh, income tax on it. One of the big fights over the Biden uh, 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 infrastructure, so-called infrastructure, uh, uh, social infrastructure plan was to say the, the most unfair economic uh, giveaway at all is the giveaway to the financial sector in the form of what's called carried interest, which means uh, trading specu speculative gains by uh, large uh, banking firms that are manipulating the market. And uh, I think of all of the uh, uh, proposals that Biden had, uh, tax, uh, financial gains, uh, this was the first to go because the financiers said, if you want us to continue giving money to your candidates uh, to beat the Republicans, then uh, you'd better drop uh, anything that's going to attack Wall Street. Uh, uh, remember, uh, Democrats, you were the party of Wall Street, uh, and so they did that. The next most popular uh, proposal of, uh, uh, that Biden had originally made in his plan was to uh, uh, forgive student debt. Well, again, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, company, uh, corporate company, said, wait a minute, you've got to have uh, stu uh, student debt uh, being paid because the students have to pay the student debt. They're going to have to go to work and uh, go into the labor force and take whatever uh, we uh, are willing to pay them uh, in order to not fall behind in their, in, in their student debt. So uh, essentially you have uh, what is holding down wage rates, what's holding down working conditions in the United States is finance uh, and economic debt. And the uh, rent extraction seems to be also happening on the other end with yes. the current inflation, uh, which it strikes me is probably part not just the result of all of this COVID money that's been blasted out into the world uh, mostly <laughs> through <laughs> through the big corporations and banks but also the uh, monopolization of the various goods and services that we all buy that's happened at the same time the small businesses have been driven out of business by covid and now walmart and amazon are the only options and since they have de facto monopolies they can charge whatever they want and hence uh, prices are rising very quickly. Uh, you, you think that that's, uh, that's a big factor behind inflation, this uh, consolidation uh, by the, the big uh, retail outlets and so on? Sure. The last year and a half since COVID have been a bonanza for the 1%. Uh, the stock market and bond market has gone way up. Corporate profits have gone way up. Uh, and, the, and what's also for the ninety nine percent for the workers what's gone up is their debt there there's uh talking about eight million families that are about to be evicted uh from their homes who uh were unable to pay rent uh while the, uh, uh there was a covid crisis and they they lost their jobs especially low income jobs and uh the moratorium uh, on uh back rents and back uh, debt is supposed to expire in uh, uh, February, and it's already, uh, in fact, expiring in some states, and uh, uh, you're, go you're going to have uh, millions of people strewn out of their homes, uh, and that's why you've had the uh, private capital funds uh, use this money that they've uh, cleaned up in the stock and bond market in the year and a half to uh, uh, buy property. And now uh, I think over a quarter of all of the homes that are being bid up in price are being bought by private capital companies. The idea is uh, they want to turn America from a country of homeowners into a country of renters. That's their, uh, that's, uh, their business plan, and they've, uh, they've vastly succeeded. Uh, it, it, Obama started the uh, 
uh, the process by uh, not uh, by bailing out the banks and uh, breaking his campaign promise to roll back the uh, junk mortgages to realistic uh, mortgages. Uh, instead, he uh, uh, he he said he met with his uh, campaign uh, contributors. Uh, he invited the Wall Street bankers uh, to the White House and said, "I'm the only guy standing." Uh, between you and the mob with pitchforks, but don't worry, I'm on your side. My job is to deliver my voters to you, and that's just what he did. He evic- he uh, uh, immediately evicted uh, two and a half million homeowners. He did not write down the debts, and he did not throw uh, a, a single uh, bank, uh, Wall Street bank uh, crook, uh, in jail, despite their massive uh, ripoffs and uh, financial fraud. Uh, he he did not even uh, take over the insolvent banks like uh, Citibank, like uh, Sheila Bear, who was head of the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, had urged him to do. So uh, all the problems you're having now, in a way, can be traced back uh, uh, to the Obama administration. Uh, that uh, it, It's been a single uh, – the Federal Reserve has been uh, essentially financed, single-handedly financing uh, the stock market and the bond market, while uh, the government has been giving away monopoly privileges to increase uh, profits to uh, help support stock and bond prices. And uh, uh, that's been a disaster for the economy at large. Uh, but again, I, I'm not sure where, where one can fit this into the uh, academic uh, curriculum, which is why uh, most of the students I had decided that economics really wasn't very interesting uh, to get a degree in and uh, went into other subjects like anthropology or sociology or whatever. And that's why, uh, you know, you're talking about these problems uh, today uh, uh, on, uh, uh, on radio and the Internet, but it's not being uh, talked about in uh, the, finan- in the uh, New York Times or the Wa- Washington Post. Certainly isn't. Well, he- here's a question for, for you since you're an economist. This is something that I uh, wouldn't be able to figure out myself, but... Yeah, my my dad was a professor of finance uh, as his final job, his last job, and we used to discuss uh, these matters. He he was a pretty conservative, common sense guy who thought that you know he thought differently because he'd actually run a business and then retired and became a professor of finance. And he thought that um, a lot of the the profession was was overly theoretical and stuff. And, and he, he he believed in the sort of regression to the mean approach to things. That is, if uh, the price earnings ratio is out of whack. It's going to have to return back to the norm and so on. And, and so one of those uh, ratios that I believe is a little out of whack right now would be the, the percentage of people's incomes that they're, they're paying for their housing uh, compared to their overall income, right? And so that yep. supposedly it, it just always has to return to some mean. I don't remember precisely what the numbers are here. Maybe you do. But the question would be if these rent seeking oligarchs succeed in buying up enough of the U.S. housing stock, are they going to be able to permanently change that ratio so that it'll never regress down to the mean? Like if, you know, just you, you have the right numbers, but let's just say 30, normally people spend um, 25 to 30 percent of their income on housing. And let's say it's up to 35 to 40 percent now. Can they permanently change that and force people to continue to pay 35 to 40 percent of their income for housing if they buy up enough of the housing stock? Or do you think it'll inevitably inevitably bounce back to the historical levels? I don't see it bouncing back and, unless there is uh, a change in the tax system. And uh, if there was, was a change in the tax system, the whole financial system uh, would collapse because 80% of uh, bank loans in the United States are mortgage loans. And uh, these mortgage loans uh, to homeowners are guaranteed by the government up to the point where they absorb 43% of your income. Well, imagine, and this is uh, the legal maximum in the United States. Uh, Fannie Mae, uh, uh, the government uh, uh, mortgage insurance uh, agency, uh, says we will guarantee the loan so that you will not make money, but you can't take more than 43% of uh, the income because otherwise it would be unstable. Well, when I came to New York in 1960, uh, there was a rule for banks. Uh, uh, 
uh, banks would uh, not uh, make a mortgage loan for a home that absorbed more than 25% of the borrower's income. So already we've had uh, the income go from 25% to 43%. Well, just imagine the status of uh, uh, workers now. If 43% of their income goes for housing, and in New York City, it's often 50%. Uh, of their income. Uh, we'll in San Francisco, it's 200%. Pay... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, th- this is why the United States uh, uh, cannot reindustrialize. As long as the house prices absorb this high a rate of income, and as long as the banking sector uh, is supporting uh, this, and as long as the political parties say, uh, we will not tax, uh, uh, we, uh, we will continue to untax real estate so that all of the rising land value will be able to be pledged to banks to pay interest instead of to pay taxes. Uh, essentially, it's the untaxing of real estate in the United States that has subsidized the increase in uh, housing prices because uh, housing prices are worth whatever a bank will lend to buy a house. If you uh, you have to go to a bank and uh, if they lend more and more and uh, you don't, uh, this money isn't taxed away. Well, the, the price is going to go up. So you have uh, the government policy, the bank policy, all uh, trying to promote this high uh, diversion of income into paying land rent. Again, the exact opposite of what Adam Smith and classical economics and John Stuart Mill, the whole 19th century, had advocated. Well, uh, this this has priced American labor and industry out of world markets. There's no way in which, uh, if you have to pay 43% uh, of your uh, income for a rent, if uh, the government were to give you all of your goods and services for nothing, all of your food, all of your clothing, all of your transportation for nothing, you still uh, uh, you'd have to pay so much money for rent and for health care that uh, you couldn't compete with uh, labor in uh, Asia or the third world or even Europe. Uh, and so this is what is essentially uh, excluded the United States from uh, having a successful empire. It's all uh, it, it's the greed of the financial sector, basically, and the takeover of the government by the financial sector here, as as it happened under Margaret Thatcher in England and Tony Blair. Uh, you've had both countries uh, essentially uh, enter their permanent austerity program, and uh, the on, uh, only way to cure this is for housing prices to go down. But if you, the housing prices go down, then the banks will go broke. That's what Obama said. He has to support the banks because uh, if, he'd, uh, uh, if he'd actually uh, lowered the uh, housing prices uh, to realistic levels that would enable America to survive, that the banks would go under. Uh, until, unless uh, you're willing to restructure the banking system, you're not going to be able to reindustrialize the American economy. Well, that's interesting. And, you know, Ellen Brown has been on the show many times talking about the need to make uh, banking a public utility. And uh, I don't know whether to, I guess, yeah, I I recently read Stephanie Kelton's book. uh, I'm forgetting the title, but she argues that essentially we can fix all kinds of problems and bring back full employment and and have all sorts of goodies simply by having the government spend uh, more money that the you know this is the the modern monetary theory position and maybe that is true to a certain extent in the US due to these privileges that you describe in super imperialism i doubt if it's it's nearly as true anywhere else uh but i'm not sure that that is uh, possible uh, right now, for all these reasons that you've been describing, uh, but if you do, you do you think that a uh, if the U.S. ever does opt for more of a Bernie Sanders style uh, pro modern monetary theory uh, kind of uh, set of administrators, would they quickly run into the limits of spending money uh, due to these international factors, uh, Chinese and, and Russians, and this new block arising? That, no, uh, there. There's no uh, limit to how much uh, domestic money you can uh, create to spend domestically. Uh, right now, the banks are creating uh, all the credit. Uh, and Stephanie says uh, uh, the, uh, you don't have to rely on banks to create credit. Uh, the government can simply 
uh, uh, creates a credit instead of the banks, and it doesn't have to charge interest. It doesn't have to uh, go into debt. Uh, Stephanie was my department chairman at the University of Missouri at Kansas City, and we've gone around the world uh, together giving speeches uh, uh, and, and uh, lectures uh, on this. So uh, her logic is quite correct. Uh, uh, the problem is that uh, modern monetary theory has been taken over by somebody in a much stronger position than Stephanie, uh, by Donald Trump. And Donald Trump said, uh, we can uh, uh, just create all the money we want. And uh, uh, he uh, cut the taxes and went on spending. Uh, and uh, he was willing to do it. Uh, Stephanie was the uh, economist for the Congressional uh, Budget Committee uh, and was an advisor to Bernie Sanders. But uh, uh, the Democratic Party uh, gimmicked the election to make sure that Sanders and people who uh, uh, were advising him would not uh, have a chance of getting into government. And uh, they chose uh, the Donald Trump version of modern monetary theory, where the government creates money and gives it to the bank. The, government, the quantitative easing has created trillions and trillions of dollars, but it's all been used to buy stocks and bonds and package mortgages. It hasn't been used to spend into the economy, which is what uh, Stephanie wants. So the question is, if the government's going to create money, is it going to be spending spent into the economy, which is what the MMT uh, group that I'm a member of uh, is, is advocating, or is it going to be given to Wall Street just to support uh, stock and bond prices uh, and uh, promote financialization? Uh, that's really the uh, the great issue uh, financially in uh, economic policy today. Okay, and I think that's a good place to end it. Uh, so thank you so much, Michael Hudson. Uh, I appreciate your, your fantastic uh, landmark book, Super Imperialism, as well as your ongoing uh, columns, which people can find at uh, the UNS Review at UNZ.com, where I'm also a columnist and probably where many of you are listening to this radio show. Uh, appreciate your, your great work, and I hope that down the line you can come back on the show and we can talk about some promising solutions or uh, at least some, some more positive political developments than we've seen so far. Well, you've asked all the right questions, and uh, the, our discussion shows that uh, there are a lot of powerful interests preventing a solution. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, when we're going to have a realistic uh, discussion about that, but uh, we, it is important for people to know that there is an alternative. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Michael Hudson. Uh, great conversation. Uh, look forward to talking again sometime. Take Good care. Thank you for inviting me. Okay. Bye-bye. Uh-huh.